Spirit. In your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we are going to cover verses 26 through 40. 1 Corinthians 26 through 40. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being our God, and we thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. Lord, we thank you that you are just so faithful. Thank you for this beautiful morning, for us being able to gather in your name to worship you, to read your word, to learn. We pray that you would edify us as we go through your word, that you'd be our teacher this morning, Father. Remove me of myself. May your Holy Spirit just move mightily this morning, Father. We just love you so much, Lord, and we want to honor you with your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So there was an atheist and there was a Christian, both arguing one for the stance of God, the other for the stance of nothingness. As the Christian pleaded with the atheist, God is real. I'm telling you, there is a living God. The atheist in arrogance says, well, prove it. Show me that God exists. And the atheist laughing and smirking and being snarky, laughing because the Christian had somewhat of a struggle of proving God's existence, seeing as you can't see God. It's somewhat of an issue to say, well, look. And the Christian trying to explain to the guy, look, God is invisible, but he created all things. And the guy says, no, 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 you misunderstand. All things come from a big boom, from the big bang. The, something blew up, no, nothing blew up, and all of a sudden everything exists. The Christian looking at him says, how can nothing blow up? How can there be a big bang from nothing? And he says, well, we don't know. And he says, well, I'm telling you, God put that into motion. He says, I don't deny the big bang. I'm fine with the big bang. But God is the one that put it into order. And the guy says, no, you're, you're, you're totally lost. He says, the big bang happened and the universe was in chaos for billions of years. And after time, somehow, you know, the planets started orbiting the sun, came to the perfect distance. He says, it, it's all chance. And so the Christian looks at the atheist and says, you know what, let's take your stance. He says, I'll bet you that 1964 Apollo over there with the low rider rims and the hydraulics and the loud system, you know how that came to be? And he says, of course. He says, GM made it. It's a Chevy. He says, of course I know how. He says, no, that's not how it was made. He says, it was made like this. He says, a tornado hit a junkyard. And after millions of years of the tornado spinning at the junkyard, it spit out the Chevy. And the atheist looks at him like he's an idiot and says, bro, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. He says, that makes more sense than you telling me all of life and existence comes from chaos in the universe. Now, we should hear that and it should make us ponder like, that's a great point. Nobody would ever look at a 1964 Chevy Impala and say, that's the product of a tornado hitting a junkyard. That makes no sense. That's inconclusive because it's too accurate. How would the wheels get there with air in them, with rims, with the drivetrain, the differential, got an engine with all the spark plugs, it's got a radio, an air conditioner. Never in a million years could a tornado make that happen from a junkyard. And we'd all agree that that's called a design. We look at the universe and the universe is designed. Our earth sits exactly the amount of space away from the sun necessary for us to have habitable life. Do so you know if you push the sun away 100 miles further from the sun, there would be, the earth would just be basically freeze over. It would get to the point where we'd have huge issues as far as ice goes. And if you push the sun uh, or the earth 100 miles closer to the sun, we would fry. I mean, you think of places like Carlsbad or Phoenix. I mean, Phoenix is like a living hell. It gets to like 120, 125. I think I've heard like 130. Can you imagine 100 miles closer to the sun? I mean, the world would look like that, if not more so. The earth is perfectly tilted on a 33 and a third degree axis so that it gives us all of our seasons. There's just enough water and just enough land. There's just, I mean, everything is so perfect that if you were to take any little degree from the way the earth is, from every, of, every bit of the uh, table of contents, just move anything, the earth wouldn't be habitable. It's perfect. We call that order. And I mention that because this morning we're going to go over order in the church. Because much like the universe doesn't exist out of chaos, but out of order. 
It may look like chaos to us because we don't understand how God worked it all together. But when God allowed the universe to come into being, when he spoke it into being, he knew exactly what he was doing. It's kind of like art. Have you guys ever watched an artist paint? Or have you ever watched a mechanic put an engine together? It looks chaotic. And it's like, if you don't know what's going on, it's, it's actually stressful because it's like, what are you doing? You're going to ruin it. But the mechanic or the artist says, I know exactly what I'm doing. This nut goes here, this bolt goes there, this wire goes there, this goes this. And when I watch my father-in-law work, I get frustrated because I'm like, what are you doing? You're breaking everything. And I've learned to just shut up because then he finishes and it's like, whoa, you built that room. Whoa. When you don't know what's going on, it may look chaotic, but to the person who knows what they're doing, there's an order that everything ought to be done in a specific way so that you can achieve a specific goal. We've been learning in the church about disorder in the church. We've seen that God has gifted the Christians with certain gifts, tongues, prophecy, teaching, helps, administrations, um, evangelisms, and, and we've seen lots of these great gifts. But in the Corinthian church, there was disorder. The gifts weren't being used to edify the church. The gifts were being used to puff themselves up. They were being used as a showcasing for, look at my holiness. Look how great I am. Look how God is using me. It became kind of the whole me status in church. And it was disorder. And last week we saw how prophecy ought to be used, how tongues ought to be used. And this week, Paul's going to go over those again. I know for those of us that have been here, it's kind of like again. But he's going to explain it in order. There's an order to all things. And that order is something we as Christians ought to take and bury deep within us. And remember that, that God is a God of order, not of disorder, not of confusion, but a God of order and everything that he does, everything that he puts into play, there's a way that God desires it to be done. Now, we don't have to like that order. We don't even have to agree with that order. But the fact is that order is the way God intended things to be. And if we want things to run smoothly, we'll operate according to the order in which God set forth. So let's get into our text. This God of order, verse 26, Paul saying, he says to them, what is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Remember what the purpose of the gifts was? Does anybody? To build up the church. To build up the church. That's a one, we use one word for that. It's called edification. That's what edify means, to build up, to sturdy, to make that foundation to build on. You edify the church. That's why each of us have been gifted. Each of you guys have a, an inalienable gift from God. Once it's given to you, it's not revocable. God won't take it away. You know, if you've ever met a pastor who's fallen, he still has the gift to preach or to teach or whatever his gift was. If you meet a singer, a worship leader, and they fall, their fall doesn't affect their gift whatsoever. It's an irrevocable gift, as Paul would say in Romans. We are all gifted, but the purpose of your gift and the purpose of my gift is to build each other up. The body. We're not gifted to go build the world up. We're gifted to build the church up. We take evangelism and we give that to the world. They get the gospel. And if they come to the faith, then they get to come into the church and be edified by the rest of the gifts that God has blessed us with. And then we saw last week the only other gift that has an odd use is the gift of tongues. The gift of tongues isn't meant to be a public gift. The gift, that's my son, for those of you that don't know, your wife's new. <laughs> but the gift of tongues is meant to be a self-edifying gift. Paul said last week, we saw him, that when you speak in tongues, you speak to God. When you prophesy, you speak to man. So when you speak in tongues, he says, that's you edifying yourself before God. It's the only gift that's a self-edifying gift solely for that purpose. And we're going to find today that the only time that tongues is going to be an edifying gift amongst the body is if an interpreter is present. And if an interpreter isn't present, tongues should be ceased. You shouldn't speak them. Go speak them in private. It should be ceased as far as publicly goes. But Paul says all these people have a gift. Everybody has, everyone has something to offer. Each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. So everybody has something to offer to the church. 
Just make sure what it is that you offer to the church is edifying. So if you speak in tongues, we love that you speak in tongues. It's a great thing. We're going to see today, Paul says, speak in tongues. It's good. Just make sure that when you do it, you do it the way God ordained it to be. And make sure that it's edifying. If you have any gift, don't do a gift. Don't ever do, use your gifts to please me. Please don't do that. You, you, can't, you can't please me enough, you guys. Just to let you know. Make sure you use your gifts to please God. And when you use your gifts to please God, inevitably, you're going to edify the church. Because if you're doing it to please God, you're going to do it the way he intended it to, to be done. When you do things the way God intended them to be done, you complete the goal that God had in mind when he gave you that gift. The big issue in the Corinthian church was they weren't doing things to please God. They weren't doing things because it was the right thing to do. They were doing things, again, it was called the showcase. I know a lot of us have been to churches where they showcase. I was talking to Ruth last week. Oh my God, ended up on a different tangent, so I had to call her and we talked for like 30, 40 minutes. And she was telling me about this church that she went to when she was, became a new believer. And she said she walked in. Is it okay if I say this, Ruth? It didn't seem private, so I mean, it was... And so, you know, it, she went, walked in and there were just... Everybody was speaking in tongues, she said. And it was just this... She felt like, this is weird. Do you know what they were saying? No. I, did, I would imagine you didn't. Was everybody doing it? That makes it even more confusing. You got all these people just going off, talking in tongues, and you got this new little Christian here that, you know, you probably grew up Catholic, so you have an idea of what, who Jesus is, and you have a concept of the Bible, and now you walk into this Protestant church where they're not Catholic, but they love Jesus, they believe Jesus, they believe the Bible, and everybody's talking in a strange language. Everybody's doing it at the same time, nothing makes sense. The first time I experienced that, I felt like Ruth felt. I felt alienated, like, I don't know what's going on, I just know it's not right. And I never wanted to go back to that place either, and likewise, you told me you never went back. That's called disorder. There's no unity in that, there's no edifying in that. You got a gift, you, got, you have a tongue, a psalm, a teaching. It says, let everything be done for edification. Verse 27, if anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be done by two or at the most three. It should be done by how many at most? Two or at most three. Now, when we go to those churches, is it two or three speaking? No, it's like 200 or 300 or like 23 or like two. It's a lot. Two or three at most. And notice what he says next. It's not two or three at the same time. He says two or at most three and each in turn. So when tongues are spoken, which we're not saying they don't exist, tongues exist. When they are spoken, no more than three people should speak in a tongue in a church service. That's what Paul says. That's what God gave Paul to give to us. No more than three and they should never be at the same time. They should be individual speakings. So if Mike had the gift of tongues and God had impressed him, Mike wouldn't just jump up and start speaking in tongues. We'd say, Mike, stop that. You're being disruptive. Mike might raise his hand and say, I have, I have something to speak from God. And we might say, go for it. Mike would give his message. That's one. Now, when Mike gives his message, we're going to hold off. Because look at the next piece of what he says here. He says, two or three at the most, and each in turn, and one must interpret. So Mike gives his message in tongues, or not a message, he gives his praise in tongues, and let's say Aiden knows how to interpret tongues. So Aiden says, hey, I know what that means. Okay. Aiden interprets it. Praise God, glory to the Most High, our King, the Lord and Savior, and gives it right on. And then Bertram raises his hand. I got something to say also. He speaks in tongues. Aiden says again, hey, I know what he said. Interpret. Lord Most High, we give you honor and glory. We praise your holy name. You are the blessed God, a King of kings and Lord of lords. Forever and ever we will worship you. Awesome, Bertram. And then Margaret says, I, I, I got a tongue to speak. Blah, blah, blah. She speaks her tongue. Aiden again. I can interpret that. That's what a service should look like in tongues. And at that, Teresa or somebody else, I got a tongue. Next time. Because if we just do a whole service in tongues, we never get to the edifying part of the teaching. We never get to the part where we worship God in his word. He says, no more than three. 
in, in order and let there be an interpreter. Now, have any of us ever actually experienced that? <laughs> be honest, you can raise your hand if you have. Once I have. You've experienced that where it was in order and somebody interpreted? Right. Actually, was I was safe when I was twelve years old. Awesome. Uh, in a costume with my okay. And people would be praying in tongues out loud, and then all of a sudden everybody would be quiet, and somebody would like pre say it out loud scripture. Huh. And it was interesting because people would be like, "Wow." Say a scripture. So that's not tongues. So I, I agree that they were speaking in tongues, but that wouldn't be an interpretation. So an interpretation of tongues would never be a scripture being spoken. It would be a praise of some sort. So when tongues are, we, we, you weren't here last week, when tongues are spoken, it's a praise being lifted up to God. So I mean, maybe, I guess if it was, if it was a scripture where God was being praised, but tongues is man speaking to God. It's literally, it's a prayer. Right. Uh, many people do, and a, a lot of people can speak. It. It's a good thing. But Paul, what we're talking about was we're addressing tongues in a public setting. So example, you said many people were speaking in tongues, right? Paul says, don't do that. He says two or three at most, not consecutively, at most two or three in order. So if somebody had something, if you, let's say you wanted to say something in tongues, say it. Don't, unless you know somebody can interpret it. He says, then they would say it. But make sure there's an interpreter. And if there's nobody to interpret, we're going to see, he's going to say, shh. Because what tongues are, it's a gift for privacy. It's a gift where you go into your closet and you speak in tongues. You probably don't even know what you're saying. Most people that have the gift of tongues don't know what they're saying. It's rare that somebody can interpret the tongue that they're speaking. What it is, it's they're praying to God. They're lifting up his name in praise. So, like, if somebody speaks in tongues and then somebody says, I know what she said, thus saith the Lord, they're lying already. It's never going to be a thus saith the Lord. It's never going to be God told me to tell you that's not what tongues is. It's always prayer to God. Paul made that clear last week. Tongues is men speaking to God. Well, I was only 12. That's probably what it was right. when I said it. But yeah. I, I yeah. It. Right. Now, Margaret, you said you were in a service like that, yes? What was that like? Just briefly, very briefly. Well, I've been in where it's been in order, and I've been where it's been in church for time. What did the order look like? I want to know here, what did the order look like? It, you know, it's just like everything goes quiet. And okay. someone speaks the tongue. And then somebody interprets? And then somebody interprets, and, and you know it's God. Because it, and that it's sounds God. like how it ought to be done. So that... In the rare case is how a tongue ought to be spoken. I was in one service once where the pastor spoke in a tongue and somebody interpreted, and that was it. It's a rarity, something you don't see. But rarely, typically what happens is you walk into the service and you got, again, 30, 40, 50, however big the church is, you got the whole congregation praying in tongues. Paul would discourage that. He said, don't do that. Uh, yes. No, not at all. As a matter of fact, it's, it's better that it doesn't happen than, it, than if it happened in Mass. Because you can go to your prayer closet and go speak in tongues in private. Paul last week, if, were you here last week, last Sunday? So if you remember last Sunday, Paul's stress was prophecy is better than tongues. Prophecy is better than tongues. Today we're going to see prophecy is better than tongues. Because prophecy has a public edifying. Tongues... Not so much. Prophecy, though, speaks to the individual. Tongues, we all speak to God. And it's a great thing, but prophecy is better than tongues. That's the point he's been making. Let's keep going so we can get to that. But he tells us, make sure that what we do is edifying. If there's an interpreter, let it be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or three at most. And then turn, and one must interpret. Verse 28. But if there is no interpreter, he must keep silent in the church. Now, where must he keep silent? In the church. So that answers your question right there, Grace. Right. And but listen to what he says next. And let him speak to himself and to God. So let me, let me give you an example. During worship, let, you have the gift of tongues, and so you want to speak in tongues. Do it quietly, just so it's between you and God. That's awesome. Go to a corner and pray in tongues 
quietly. If you're praying loud enough for people to hear you, I would encourage you, don't do that. Because you're now drawing attention away from the worship of the Lord. And everybody starts looking, what is she saying? Why is she speaking in tongues? What's going on? So if, if you're in a worship service or you're, you're, you know, you're on your own, go pray in tongues in your closet. Make it a private matter between you and God. It's like prayer. It's, it's a, it, it is prayer. Would you go stand on a corner and pray out loud? No. Why? Because prayer is a very personal, private thing between you and God. Now, we do have times of corporate prayer where we get together and we pray over somebody or before a teaching. But when I go to God for my personal prayer time, I don't want you guys hearing what I have to say. That's between me and God. I don't even let my wife hear what me and God talk about. That's between us. That's me and God time. My wife doesn't even get to get included in that. Nobody does. That's me and the Lord alone. That's tongues. Unless God has something publicly to say and he will equip somebody with the gift to interpret what's said. But it's pivotal to say that if there's not an interpreter, then it's better to be quiet. It's just better to be quiet. Because tongues gives this hype. There's this hype that comes with it. And when you do it publicly, it stirs people up in a, in a frenzy, I suppose is the word. It's exciting. It is. But there's no real edification if there's no interpreter. There's no real edification when you got 50 people doing it. You just get swooped up. It's like a riot. You know what makes a riot so dangerous? Is you get swooped up in the emotion. And you get people doing things they would never do. Never. You get people burning buildings, killing people, burning police stations. I mean, when you get swept up in a riot, you get so caught in commotion, you find yourself doing things you would never do. Till your face is on the news and the cops are knocking at your door and you're like, I guess I did do that. That's how tongues are. When everybody starts doing it, you just get swooped up and... But you, nobody walks away edified. You might walk away feeling spiritual. But there's a difference between feeling spiritual and being edified. The goal is to be edified. You want to know what true spiritualism is? Maturity. The mature Christian is the truly spiritual one. That's Remember we went over that whole chapter on love? If you've matured in love, you are truly a spiritual Christian. More so than any gift could ever give you. That's why Paul said love is the more excellent way. Gifts, they're going to disappear. We're going to die. You'll never speak in a tongue again. You'll never prophesy again. There will be no need for faith when we're in the presence of God. Love is forever. That's eternal. God is love. God is eternal. Love is an eternal concept. It's the more excellent way. So do you want to show yourself to be truly spiritual? Then walk in love. But spirituality doesn't come by speaking in a tongue or even the gift to teach. There's many gifted teachers that are walking like garbage. We've known some of them. There's many gifted evangelists that are, I mean, they're, they're deceivers. As far as, I mean, their walk goes, I mean, they preach a good gospel, but then they go and live sexual promisc promiscuously. And then we hear about the scandals later and we find out that they're embezzling the church. And it's like, how could he? He was so gifted. Because your gift isn't a gauge of your spiritual maturity or your spirituality. It's a gift of the Spirit of God. If he gave you the gift, he'll use it in spite of you. But the true spiritual believer walks in the essence of love. That's how you know somebody's truly spiritual. That's how you know they're truly mature. I'm more impressed by the person that walks in love than the person that can quote an entire book of the Bible. Oftentimes, because I'm the pastor, people will try to show off their spirituality to me and their gifts, and I'm not ever impressed. Once upon a time I was, but I've learned gifts come and go. God can gift a donkey to speak. He does not need anybody. You want to show me what your, your true spirituality? Show me your love. Show me your maturity in Christ. That is more impressive to me than anything. When you walk, watch somebody walk and live like Christ. But the gift means nothing. God can raise up anybody. You know, we got all these instruments up here believing God's going to bring people in or raise them up. God can raise up this boy or any of us in here to do anything he wants us to do. Even at our ages, we're not so young. God can still raise you up to do great things. He's God. He's not limited. 
maturity is the true gauge of, or sorry, love is the true gauge of your maturity as a Christian and your spirituality. So if we're going to speak in tongues, we're going to do it biblically, for sure in this church. So just so you know, if you ever break out in tongues, I'll ask you either, shh, or is there an interpreter? Never do it in the middle of a teaching. There's nothing worse than a teacher teaching and somebody just starts babbling in tongues. Why would, why would somebody do that? I would imagine God is not in the habit of interrupting, interrupting himself. Don't believe me? Look what he says here. Verse 28. But if there is no interpreter, he must keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Verse 29. Let two or three prophets speak and let others pass judgment. Quickly, before I get to what I just said, let's cover this. Let two or three prophets speak and let others pass judgment. Now the prophet worked in two ways, the office of the prophet. Either a prophet would be given a new message from God to the people and they would give that message or they would reiterate an already prophesied message. So an example, if I were to read you Jeremiah 29, that would be me reading you guys a prophecy. If I were to read you guys Mark 20 or Matthew 24, that would be me reading you guys a prophecy. These are already well-known and reiterated prophecies. Jesus spoke that particular one of things pertaining to the end. That's how prophecy works. You'd either read forth the prophecy already given, or God would have something new to say to his church. Now remember, tongues is always us speaking to God. When you speak in a tongue, it's you praising God in prayer. When you prophesy, it's God speaking to man. Again, Paul made that distinction last week. Tongues, you to God. Prophecy, God to man. So even when it comes to God speaking to man... Listen to what Paul says. <clears throat> Let two or three prophets speak, just like the tongues. Let two or three of them speak. And let others pass judgment. And the concept in let two or three speak is at a time. Have you ever been in a conversation where the other person won't shut up and you're trying to say something? And like every time you talk, they start talking over you? Isn't that like the most annoying thing in the world? Me, personally, I get in my flesh. I don't do it, but what I want to do is I want to reach over and smack them. Tell them to shut up. I let you speak, let me speak. It is like just teeth grinding when people do that. It's like, I like letting people speak. Speak, please say what you have to say. When you're done and it's my turn to speak, please let me speak. I was kind and to you. I gave you a generous amount of time. And you know how it is, the second you start talking, they I don't hit them. Of course, that's not, that wouldn't be very Christian-like or pastor-like, but it, it is frustrating. It's no less frustrating in the church if two prophets are trying to prophesy at the same time. There is no edifying in that. For those of you who were here that Thursday night a few weeks ago, remember how it was? We went to pray over this lady for healing. We anointed her with oil. We were going to pray over her. And the second I started talking, everybody started praying. Half the people in tongues and the other, I mean, I had no, I mean, I couldn't hear myself. I mean, that's cool if somebody else wanted to pray, just one at a time, please. Order. I was trying to pray for this lady and the whole idea when you pray is that we all agree in what's being said and that's what amen is about. When you say amen, that's you saying, I agree wholeheartedly. So be it is literally what it means. Nobody could have said amen to anything that I prayed because if I couldn't hear myself, they couldn't hear me. I couldn't say amen to anything anybody else said because I couldn't hear them either. It was nothing but chaos for about 30 seconds. So after I couldn't hear myself, I was trying to concentrate. I just said, your will be done, God. That was it. Amen. Took my hand off her. That was, that's all I can get out. That's all I had. So much for the prayer for that wonderful lady. <laughs> it was chaotic. It's no different in prophecy or in tongues. There has to be order. And if there's not order, then it's better to be quiet. So if three prophets are trying to prophesy, we're going to shut two of them up. I'm going to say, be quiet, please. You'll have your turn. Now, brother, you may go. Now, brother, you may go. Now, sister, you may go now. And let that be the end of it. And pray that God would bless them with the message 
that is going to edify the church because that's the whole point of the gift. So he says here something interesting. He says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others pass judgment. So when a prophet spoke in the early church, and as so today, if somebody says they have a message from the Lord, that's in essence, that's a prophecy. That's God speaking to man. God has given me something to tell you. We, as the believers of the body, are to pass judgment. The first thing you'd hear somebody say is, judge not lest you be judged, brother. You ever heard that one? That's When somebody says that, that's somebody who doesn't know what the Bible says. Judge not lest you be judged. That's totally out of context. When Jesus says to judge not lest you be judged, what he's saying is don't condemn or you'll be condemned. That's the whole idea behind that. So that Greek word for judge is the Greek word krino, K-R-I-N-O. And there's two meanings to it. And you know which meaning is which by the context of whatever's being said. The first meaning is to condemn. Don't condemn. Condemnation belongs in the hands of the Lord and the Lord alone. I will never say that person is not born again unless if they tell me Jesus isn't Lord, I can say confidently, you're not born again. Why? Because the Bible says it. It's not, it has nothing to do with me. The Bible would say you're not born again. But if somebody says they believe in Jesus and they're living all whacked out, I'll never go and say they're not born again. I'll just be like, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes when the Lord comes back. If you're, whether you're born again or not, it's between you and God, bro. Why? Because I don't have the authority to cast that kind of condemnation on somebody. To assume somebody's not born again, I mean, who goes to heaven? People who are born again. Who goes to hell? People who are not born again. So when we make the assessment that somebody is not born again, we've essentially said, you're on your way to hell. That's called condemnation. We don't have that authority unless biblically given. Again, if somebody in here were to say, I hate Jesus and I'll never serve him, we can say by scripture, you're not born again. That's not me condemning you. That's you condemning yourself according to John 3.17. He who has not believed is condemned already for he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. We all know 316. Most of us don't know 317. So when you deny Jesus, it's not me condemning you. It's the scripture condemning you because you have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But if somebody claims to be a believer, that's between them and God. Now I'll correct them as a pastor. I'll say, hey, look what you're doing, man. This isn't right. This is what scripture teaches. And if they decide they, they don't care and they're gonna go their way, that's between you and God. Doesn't mean you're not born again. Doesn't mean that's between you and God. So crino, to condemn. The other meaning for crino is to discern between righteousness and unrighteousness. We get to do that one. So when the Bible says, don't judge or you'll be judged, that word is condemn. But the Bible says in that same passage when he says, condemn not lest you be condemned, he says, don't cast your pearls before swine. So the question is, how can we define what swine is without making a judgment? He's talking about people. Don't cast your pearls before people who are like swine, unsaved people. Well, the only way you can decipher if somebody's saved or unsaved is with discernment, by judgment. You look at the person based on what's going on. You make a judgment. You make a call. So we are called to discern between righteousness and unrighteousness. When a prophet would speak in the church, they were to judge that prophet. Now there was a standard and a measure in which you judged. And that standard and measure was scripture. If a prophet spoke anything outside of the realm of scripture, it's a false prophet. Let me rephrase that. If a prophet spoke anything contrary to scripture, that's a false prophet prophet did you guys hear that you understand that now it doesn't mean it can't be a new message so long as it's in line with the script let me give you an example let's pretend like you're married still Margaret I don't want to use somebody who's actually married and I said God has a message from me for, for you Margaret you need to leave your husband and go to this guy you guys should automatically say, this dude's whacked out. And if somebody says, well, why? He's a prophet. I would say, no, he's a false prophet. Why? Because God would never demand divorce. Because what, what do the prophets say about divorce? God hates divorce is what Malachi tells us. The prophet Malachi says God hates divorce. 
So if God hates divorce and Malachi is a canonized prophet, he's known by the, the canon as a prophet, even by Jesus' standards. Well, that means that God would never tell you to divorce your spouse to go be with somebody else, ever. So the way a prophet was to be judged was according to Scripture. So when a prophet gave a message, thus saith the Lord, is what he's saying in line with what Scripture teaches. And if it is, it should be an accepted prophecy. If it's not, we should say, get out of here before we throw rocks at you. Don't really throw rocks at the prophets. But that was the command in Deuteronomy for a prophet that was false. You drag them outside and you stone them to death. Now in the New, in the New Testament, in the church, they didn't do that because of grace. But in the Old Testament, they did. And a prophet, false prophet would be stoned to death. That's what that was. Now he says, we are to judge and let others pass judgment. Verse 30, but if a revelation is made to another who is seated, the first one must keep silent. So remember I told you when a prophet would speak in the early church, there was two ways in which he would speak. One would be a reiteration of an old prophecy already given. And then there would be a new speaking. So he says, if there's a revelation, if there's a new thing to be spoken, let the new thing be spoken first. And let the person who's, already, who's reiterating, let him take a seat to the new revelation coming. That's Paul's command from God here. So that's what verse 30, 30 means. Verse 31, for, all, for, you all can, ah, for you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all may be exhorted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Order, they are to be done one by one, as Paul says here, quite plain and simple. The purpose of the prophecy is to be exhorted. If you're not being exhorted, then we want to, again, weigh and judge this prophecy. Why is this being given? I mean, God doesn't speak to his people for nothing. There's always purpose and reason, and there's, a, there's always a building behind it, whatever it is that's been given. So there should always be exhortation. And then he puts this, that the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. That that goes in line with what we just taught, that... A prophet will never speak anything outside of what the prophets have already spoken. It's going to be subject. It's always going to be in line with what God has already said. Because God is unchanging, right? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if that's the case, then God is never going to speak some new thing that's out of line with what he's already spoken. So the spirit of a true prophet is going to be subject to the prophets. And that is a standard that needs to be held. That's a standard, I'm here to tell you, that's not held in the American church. You got lots of prophets that stand up and speak a new message that is completely contrary to what Scripture often says. That's wrong. Now, why do we suppose that the tongues and the prophecies given in much of the modern church are like this? Why do we suppose that when they're given, they're given in such a way that they dishonor God? There's an old preacher, I like listening to him, his name is J. Vernon McGee. And he was once asked why pastors don't teach expository teaching. And he had one thing to say about it. He's an old southern preacher, he says, because they're lazy. The reason the church is in the chaos that it's in when it concerns these gifts is because pastors are lazy. They don't want to study the word of God. Did you know studying the Word of God is quite hard? It's not easy. It's really hard, you guys. And apart from the gift, I'm here to tell you, I don't think I could do it. Had God not equipped me by His Spirit, I don't think I could do this. It is really hard. And there is an amount of attack that comes from the enemy when you study or worship. Me and Margaret talk about that often. There is an amount of time that's put into a teaching. I was up till 3 a.m. last night studying. Why? Because I needed to finish studying. Because I've been studying all week and I wasn't finished. And I can't just come wing it for you guys and say, well, let's just wing it and see what happens. I was joking last night. I told my wife at like 9 o'clock I should just wing it. But of course I can't do that because God wouldn't let me. You know, I wouldn't do that to you guys either. So I was up till 3 in the morning studying. Don't be like, oh, how righteous and how. No, that's what it takes. That's what it takes to feed you guys a legitimate message. So why are pastors doing these things contrary to what Scripture says? It's because they don't know what their Bible says because they don't study the Word of God. They study the handful of passages that they know, 
And they study the handful of passages that they like. And they don't study them honestly often, I should say. They study them according to what they think they mean. So when they come to teach you and they tell you, you should speak in tongues. Everybody, let's all speak in tongues. And you, you wonder why when the scriptures say plainly, we're going to read it here in a moment. Paul says, don't do that. You don't have to study to find that one out. You just have to read it at face value. And the reason it's so is because pastors today are lazy. I believe that most pastors that are where they're at are there by selfish gains and means. I really don't believe God has called most of the pastors today in this world to be where they're at. I believe a lot of pastors are there because they like the spotlight, because they like the attention. I, that's, that's pretty much it. You, know, you guys see me up here, or even you online, you see me, you see me here, and you think, oh, the spotlight for that hour, or two hours a week, wow. Really? What about the rest of the week that I'm dealing with issues and sin and, and my own problems and my family and spiritual attack and again stuff. I like going to bed at like, I usually like midnight. I don't like staying up till three. I can't stand staying up that late, but often I'm up till three, four in the morning to feed. I just don't, you don't feel bad for me. That's just, that's when I get some of my best studying done. I don't like doing it though. I like studying better like in the mornings. I can't study in the mornings. I have an infant, so he's a toddler now, but he takes the majority of my time during the day. So I find myself studying through the nights. And it's God is gracious to me by doing that. I'm able to get it done. I'm not looking for sympathy. I'm just letting you know what it takes. Most pastors won't do that. They'll wing it. It's easier to wing it. I have enough Bible knowledge that I could have come in here and winged it. And you guys would have probably never known the difference. Honestly. I would have known. I would have drove off today feeling guilty and God would have convicted me and I would have felt horrible for the rest of the week knowing that I robbed the church of God by not putting in the work due. But pastors are lazy. That's why the church is the way it is today. Specifically in America. And the worst part is we take our garbage and we go dump it into places like Jamaica, Bulgaria, Africa, I've been to some of these places and they look like some of these messed up, whacked out churches in America. Completely, completely disobeying the word of God with their services. To me, it's mind boggling. But that's what happens when lazy people take the pulpit. I love Paul's last piece here in verse 33. He says, For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. I like the New King James. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. We serve a God of order. And with God, things will always be done orderly. This word confusion is the Greek word akatastasia. And it means disorder, confusion, disorder. They're synonymous. They're, there's this, this disorder. God is not a God of disorder. Do you guys remember when Jesus feeds the multitudes in Luke 9? He's got like thousands of people. It says like 4,000 men, not including women and children. And then there's another one. He's got 7,000 men, not including women and children. So we think there's upward of fourteen or 15,000 people. I mean... Look at here, how many? One, two, three, four, we'll count five, six, the boys, seven. That's including three, two boys and a toddler. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight women. That doubles. Well, Israel was no different. Women were flocking to Jesus like crazy. Families were flocking to him. So if there's 7,000 men, there's probably at least 14,000, maybe more upwards of 20,000 people. What does he tell his disciples to do? He says, gather them in about groups of 50 and sit them down. Order. Let's put order. And then Jesus does his miracle, multiplies the loaves and the fishes, and he feeds everybody. But he didn't just do it and just start throwing out loaves. Here's a fish. Here's a... No, get them in order. Let's sit down and let's do this right. We don't serve a God of confusion or a God of disorder, but a God of peace and of order. Again, we look at the universe, and this universe is a universe of order. 
Our world is a world of order. Our world is a perfect harmony of order. Again, as I said in the beginning, you just take one little thing chemically in this world out, so one of those little, um, I can't think of the, the, the periodic table of elements, you pull one little thing out or twi tweak it or change it, and our entire ecosystem falls. All of it. It's incredible when you look at that. Like I'm, I'm not even kidding a little bit. You tweak it just by the finest hair, and we, this would be an inhabitable planet. It is the craziest thing. This system of, of, of order, there's a beautiful word for it when you're talking to unbelievers. It's called the teleological argument. Teleological. And it's the argument of order that is one of the ways, one of the greatest ways that a Christian could defend the faith of God to somebody who doesn't believe is using the teleological argument. It's also known as the watchmaker's theory. Now, I like wearing watches. I got this watch here, right? On the surface, watches don't look that complicated. Look, three little hands, one counts seconds, one counts minutes, the other counts hours. It doesn't seem very complicated at all. But if I were to crack this watch open, as a matter of fact, you can kind of see through this watch, there is gears and springs and things moving in there, and there's hundreds of them in there. If you were to alter anything inside this watch, by the tiniest bit, the watch is no good anymore. You'd have to go to a watchmaker and they'd have to recalibrate and redo everything in that watch to get it running smooth again. If you alter it just by the smallest increment, this watch won't work properly or at all. We look at something this intricate, kind of like we talked about earlier with the 1964 Impala. This is way too advanced to be something by chance. It has a maker. There's an intelligent design behind it. This universe has an intelligent design behind it. Have you guys, has anybody in here ever like just watched a documentary on blood or like on the human body and how it works? The human body is the most impressive thing in existence. It is incredible. I used to be a mortician and I've seen the insides of bodies. And it is incredible to see what's on the inside. Every little vein, every little, they sprout out in like little trees and the way the blood flows throughout the body to the muscles, the bones, the way they connect the, it is nuts. And then you get on the molecular level and you start looking at DNA and you code that and it creates books that have filled this room. I mean like one person's DNA could fill the Grand Canyon, I think it's like 14 times. If you were to code it out in books. That is not disorder, that is order. Well, the church is God's body, as we saw in previous chapters. And as God's body, the way our bodies work orderly, does it, is anybody in here suffer with issues? Probably all of us. You have a, what is it, a arthritis? Your eyesight's not the best? My wife has bad eyesight? I'm fat. I mean, we all got things going on, right? That's what happens when our body starts working out of order. It starts messing up. And it starts working the way it's not supposed to work. Because I'm fat, my heart probably has issues. I don't know. It probably has issues. I, I don't know. Last time I had my heart checked, they said I was healthy. I don't know how, because I really am fat. I mean, there's no other way to say that. I can just say I'm not, but I am. I may not look like it, but trust me, that gut is there. I like to wear baggier shirts so you can't see my gut. <laughs> you know, but... When our body isn't working in the order it's supposed to, we get sick. We can't walk the same. We can't run the same. We can't lift the same. We struggle to see. We struggle to do. We are Christ's body. And when we work out of the order in which God created it, the body of Christ becomes sick. And it doesn't work the way God intended it to work. And it is imperative that we keep ourselves healthy spiritually as a church. And that is why Paul, I believe, has stressed prophecy and tongues for three chapters. 11, 12, and 12, 13, and 14. He has stressed this. I feel bad, kind of I'm like, man, I feel like this is the song that never ends. Because we've been talking about this over and over and over because I believe Paul is stressing it to the degree that we get it through our thick heads.
The body must operate in order so that it can do and function the way it was supposed to. If the body of Christ functions the way God designed it to, poverty would disappear. Did you know that? The widows would really be taken care of, and orphans would be taken care of, and abortions wouldn't be happening the way they are in mass. The church would be able to take in these babies. Did you know if the body of Christ operated the way God intended it to, most of the issues that you see in our society would not even exist. But the body of Christ is sickly because we have lazy pastors that don't teach their congregations. Now, there's always going to be problems. I'm not saying all the problems will just disappear. But much of what we see is simply a product of a sick church. It really is. Go, go read church histories and watch the, read through the revivals that happened throughout the centuries and how beautiful when the church bloomed, how society bloomed with the church. And when the church went down, the society went to hell with it. Every time, throughout church history, America's on its way down in that handbasket to hell. And part of us, part of what is what to blame is it's the church. The church isn't working the way. Today you see many of the churches supporting gay marriage. It's contrary to scripture. You hate gays? I don't hate gays. You can go be gay if you want. That's between you and God. I'm just not going to support gay marriage. Marriage is a, a God-ordained institution. God says it's wrong, then it's wrong. You want to be gay? Go be gay. That's fine. That's between you and God. I'm not, I don't advocate for that, but you have free will. You're saying that you, know, you can pick throw anything in there. You have a free will. You can do anything you want to do. But we're just not going to allow anything into the church because there's order. And in that order, it's going to work the way God intended this church to work. With that being said, God puts another thing into play. Women, buckle up. So when we read the end of verse 33, I don't believe it really fits better than 33. Do you guys remember those two dates that I give you guys that deal with scripture? Does anybody? The first one is 1227 AD. Stephen Langton he took the Bible and he said, you know, this is hard to read. I'm going to put chapter breaks in. And so what he did is he broke up the entire Bible and put chapter divisions. Thank you, Stephen Langton. That made my life so much easier navigating the Bible. And then about 200, 300 years later, another guy came along and said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take all these chapters and I'm going to put breaks throughout the chapter and make verses. 1551, Robert Stephanus did that. Thank you, Robert Stephanus. They did a great job. So I can say something like, hey, turn to 1 Corinthians 14. We're going to cover verse 26 to 40. You guys know exactly where that's at. Thank you guys for doing that. That was great. Issue, when they made those divisions, they made them according to what they thought and where they thought they should go. So if we were reading this in the original language, there's no chapter and there is no verse. And so when we look at the end of verse 33 where it says, as in all the churches of the saints... That better fits in verse 34. So that's how we're going to read it. So he says, For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Then he says, As in all the churches of the saints, the women are to keep silent in the churches. The women are to keep silent in the churches. Now that sounds kind of chauvinistic and mean and very unfriendly and unloving to women, but it's not. For people that don't know church history, the church is the champion for women's rights. Christ, specifically, is the champion for women's rights. Period. There's nothing chauvinistic about it. We're going to see that this is still dealing with order. So he says, the women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to be subject themselves, but are to subject themselves, just as the law also says. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. Now, let me make sure we understand what this is saying. This isn't saying, women, you're never allowed to speak in a church. What this is implying is women aren't allowed to teach from the pulpit in church, and they're not. That is a biblical concept. Not that women aren't great teachers. I've met women, some women that are excellent teachers. They're not to teach. That's just what it is. Women are to teach other women. So like if there's a women's conference, you should have women teaching. That's great. But when it comes to the church service, 
A man should be the one who speaks. Well, that's just chauvinistic. No, that's the order in which God created it to be. Kind of like men can't give birth. I don't see me saying, that's just feminist. I can't believe... Oh, they. No, men can't be, give birth because God created order between man and woman. Women have the ability to give birth. They have fallopian tubes and ovaries and they have a uterus. I don't have any of those things. And I'm glad I don't. I don't have the ability. I don't have a vagina. I'm glad I don't. That's a necessary factor for giving birth. <laughs> but you know, order. Why is it that a man should teach? Because that's how the order in which God created it to be. Kind of like the man is to lead his household. Well, I don't think men should lead. Men ought to lead. You want a real blessed family and a blessed home? Then the man should man up and lead his home. And a man who doesn't lead his home, that's a home that's always in chaos. Disorder always. When a man doesn't lead his home, you find a rebellious wife and rebellious children. And you find stress and confusion. Now when the man leads, does it make sense? Usually no, it doesn't. But it always works. Would that make, did that be a true statement, babe? Half the things I do make no sense. Did she tell you? She doesn't get why, but God impresses certain things on my heart. And she just goes with the flow because she trusts that God is working through me. So that takes an amount of faith, of faith on the wife's part to let me lead. Because again, the things that I do don't always make sense to her. But God has a way of working it perfectly every time. And then you know who gets the glory in the midst of it all? God. Because that's the order in which God designed it to be. It's just what it is. It doesn't mean women aren't capable. If a man refuses to lead, I don't blame the woman for leading. I don't, there are many homes where men won't man up. And so the woman is forced to lead and that's, God I believe will bless that because that man has basically not covered his wife and protected her spiritually. But women are to keep silence in the churches. So let's give a little backdrop of kind of what was going on in this time. Now I've heard several different things. I'm going to give you one of the instances that I learned that I don't necessarily agree with, but you should know what it is. In, in many of the churches, especially in the Old Testament, the women would sit apart from the men. Okay, And during the church service, what some of the pastors and commentators that I've read would say is the woman would call out to her husband on the other side of the room, Hey, George! What, what, what is he saying? Disrupting the service. Maybe that's what was happening. I personally don't think that's what was happening. You guys remember a few Thursday nights ago, that lady that was here, she kept asking questions? If you're watching this, we love you. Ask... I don't mind questions. I will limit questions, however, because we don't want to make the whole service about questions. So if you ever have a question, raise your hand. If it's a complicated question, I'll tell you, talk to me after service. If you keep raising your hand, I'll tell you, write down the questions and talk to me after service. 99% of the time, if you have a question, just hold off, and what I say in a minute will probably answer your question. 99% of the time. But I don't mind engaging with the people, so I don't mind taking a question. Here and there, it's great. What I believe is what's happening in the church is, you see how we're all kind of sitting together? Kind of like today, we had several ladies. I got, I got a question. Remember that lady, she kept asking, she asked a little too many questions. I was getting ready to tell her to just write them down. But that's what was happening. Women weren't used to worshiping like this. You can't blame the women for their curiosity and for their ferventness to want to know the Lord and ask, Pastor, hold on, I got a question. And, I believe that's what was happening. And I believe Paul says, Shh. don't ask the questions. Now again, for you guys, I say, if you got a question, don't be afraid to ask. But don't get sad if I tell you, just write it down and talk to me afterwards either. Because what we don't want to do is we don't want to interrupt the service. We don't want to interrupt whatever God is doing in that moment. You know, that one night, we went on some major rabbit trails because that chick had a lot of questions. What was her name? I can't remember her name. Patricia. Patricia. Judy, Julie, Julia. She had a lot of questions. They were good questions. They are great questions. But it got us off track of what we were doing. I answered them. It's what it was. She was new. She didn't know. It's nothing, there's nothing wrong. She didn't know. She probably thought we were just a regular Bible study. The questions are to be held off. 
But notice what he says here next. He says, The women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to be subject to are to subject themselves, just as the law says, if they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home. Now who are they to ask? Their own husbands at home. Men, you ready? Buckle up. God holds you accountable for studying and knowing scripture to cover your wife spiritually. So that if you leave the service today and your wife says, what did he mean? God, it appears, would hold you accountable to some degree to know how to answer your wife. So men, let's not be lazy. We must be in the word of God. We must be spending our own time in the scriptures. We must be studying the scriptures. So that when your wife comes to you and says, hey, hon, what do you think this means? You can answer your wife in a mature spiritual manner. It doesn't say go ask the pastor afterward. Now, you're welcome to come ask me anything you want. But what Paul says is, wives, go to your husbands. So you see, I am not your covering. Some of you, widow, widow, or divorce, you don't have. I, I am a covering to some of you to some degree. I'm a covering to all of you to some degree. But Bertram, you are the covering to your wife. Mike, you are the covering to your wife. Stan, you are the covering to your wife. I am a covering to my wife. It's none of your jobs to cover my wife. As a matter of fact, you cover her, you and I will have issues. It's not your job. It's not my job to cover your wives. That's your job. Now, me being the pastor again, I cover all of you to some degree. Some more than others, depending on your marital status. But men, we ought to be equipped, studied, and ready to answer our wives in any question they might have. How many of us can say we can do that? Maybe you can, maybe you can't, I don't know. But it should definitely be an encouragement to want to be in the Word of God more, to take our times with God more seriously. So, one of the things I do want to mention is when Paul says this, again, that chauvinistic feeling might brush off and be like, how can he say that? Women prophesied in the New Testament Women were the first people at the tomb of Christ at the resurrection. Women were the first to see the resurrected Christ. Women are not put on the back burner as far as God is concerned. This has nothing to do with women aren't allowed to speak. This has to do with order. Again, if somebody keeps shouting out, asking questions in the middle of the service, that creates disorder. That creates a confusion. That gets people's attention off what was happening. That gets the pastor's attention off what he was saying. What the Spirit of God may have been saying through him in that moment. But women are always elevated in the Scriptures. Even in the Old Testament. Even in the Old Testament. When God made Eve and presented her to Adam, she was presented as an equal. Adam was still over her because that's the order but she wasn't presented as a slave, as an equal. And they were to be one flesh. When we go through the law of Moses, the daughters of Zelophehad, he has those five daughters, and they're like, they come to Moses and they're like, hey, our dad died. Our daddy didn't have a son. When in the Old Testament, when land was inherited and the land allotments were given, the, the inheritance of when the father died went to the son. Or to the next of kin. They go to Moses and say, hey, dad died, but he didn't have a son. All he has is five daughters. What are we supposed to do, Moses? Moses doesn't say, hey, you know what? Your women, suck it up. Go sell yourselves to one of the other tribes. He takes the matter before God, and God says, they're right in coming to me in this. And he says, give them the land. And they split the land up between themselves, the five women. So women have always been elevated in the presence and eyes of God. Now, in cultures, women have not been elevated. I get that. And there have been massive, you know, bad things done to women. Let's use another word. But let's say women have definitely been treated awfully by many cultures. Even to this day, in many cultures, women are still devalued and looked at as properties. But not in Christianity. 
not even in Judaism, not in not with God. Women have always been elevated. So don't think of this as some chauvinistic, women have to shut up. No, this is about order. Women, you're allowed to prophesy. You're allowed to speak in tongues. You're allowed to ask questions. Just don't do it in the middle of the service. Now, this was a specific problem to Corinth. So don't think that in every church you go to, women are doing this. This was a problem that Paul was addressing specifically in the church of Corinth. But it applies anywhere and everywhere. Men, I would say if men were doing that in this church, I'd say, hey, men, same concept. There must be order as all things are done. So as the teaching is going on, we have order while we teach. He says in verse 36, was it from you that the word of God first went forth or has it come to you only? Again, not speaking of women now, but speaking to the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church operating in such disorder, he tells them, was it from you that the word of God first went? You guys are doing all things out of the order that we've given you like if it was given to you by God. He says, no, I am the authority here that God has sent me over this church. I am the one who established this church. It didn't come forth from you. And then he says it here, or has it come to you only? Did God give you guys some special revelation he didn't give to the other churches? No, because the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. The self-assertion of the Corinthian church was out of hand. And they were operating in ways that a church should not operate. He says in verse 37, If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. So everything Paul just said, who is it really from? God. It is the Lord's commandment. Well, I don't agree with Paul. I think we should all talk in tongues and prophesy in disorder. Paul says, if you think yourself to be spiritual, then understand this. What I have given you is from God. These are my opinions. These are my thoughts. This is what God has given me to give to you. I love that he says that. If anyone thinks he's a prophet or spiritual, that kind of puts a damper on anybody who would try to oppose Paul, right? Because who's going to be like, I'm not spiritual or a prophet. I don't agree. No, they all wanted to be seen as spiritual and prophets. Verse 38, he says, But if anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. If you don't recognize this, he says, you are not recognized. If you can't recognize my authority, in essence, then you are not to be recognized as a prophet or anything prominent in the church. If you are not to recognize what's being said here as the Lord's commandment, then the people are to look at you as something else. That's how we ought to look at the people who dishonor the word of God with the way they operate in many of these churches today. We give them more esteem than they are. Have you guys ever seen one of those Benny Hinn conferences? <laughs> They're the craziest thing. The dude's got like superpowers. I mean, it's all orchestrated, but he runs across and swings his jacket and like 400 people fall down. That's incredible. Dude, take him to war. You can do that, man. Go knock down all those Taliban, bro. What are you, what are you doing here? <laughs> I mean, but it's incredible. They jump on the stage and everybody on the stage falls down and it looks like a Street Fighter game. It's the most incredible thing. He flicks you in the head and you fly back like six feet. It's like, what in the world is going on? Paul would tell him, if he's not going to recognize what Paul has written here and what's been said, he says, then if you consider yourself spiritual, you're not to recognize him if he refuses to acknowledge this. We ought to be careful who we put ourselves under. Be careful who you allow to cover you. Make sure that the one who covers you covers you with the word of God. I really believe that many of these churches that operate are operating under demonic spirits. I, I really do, man. True demonic oppression. You see the things take place and you see how the scripture portrays demons and what happens when Jesus comes. They fall down and have these seizures. That's what they do in all these conferences, right? The people fall back and they're all shaking. and That's demon possession. That's not the spirit of God moving. Come on. I won't even get into that. Verse 39, Therefore, my brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy. Why desire to prophesy? Because more people are edified by prophecy. Because we can all understand prophecy. We went over that in the last chapter. I'm not going to you know, go over it again. Therefore, my brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy. And do not forbid to speak in tongues. 
But all things must be done properly and in orderly manner. Do not forbid them to speak in tongues. You know, so for the per- person who says, we well, you know we don't believe in speaking in tongues, no, we do believe in speaking in tongues here. It just must be done orderly. We'd rather you that you prophesy in a language that we can understand. If you're going to speak in a tongue, bring it with an interpretation, and we'll just gladly hear you. Other than that, keep quiet. Prophesy. What I do here, this is a form of prophecy as we read forth the Word of God. This is more particularly, this is teaching. When we teach the Word of God, this ought to be done in order also. I don't just get to mix, match, and flip-flop the scriptures and make it say what I want. No, we teach the scripture in order so that we have a full context of all that's being said by God. Order. There must be order in the church for the church to operate properly. And I pray that as we go out this week that we would live our lives in the order in which God has set us forward. That you would work in the gift orderly the way God has given you, that you would do as God has ordered you to do, that you would operate in prayer, in his word, spending time with him, edifying and covering your wife, your children, your family, and that that order would bring edification to you and all around you guys. I really pray that you guys, you know, these last three chapters have been tough because I feel like it's been one big reiteration after another. But again, Paul saw, saw it fit to lay it out like this, so we covered it. Next week, we start chapter 15, and chapter 15 is the pinnacle of 1 Corinthians. I mean, Paul is going to cover so much real estate. We'll probably spend two to four teachings in it. I, I got to study it to see where I get, but I was going over it. I mean, it's looking more like it's going to take about a month to get through it. But there is so much in there. Again, this is like this crescendo where it comes to a height. And chapter 15, we're going to cover the resurrection in depth. We're going to cover the physical resurrected body. Paul's going to give all these great examples. And it's going to be one of those chapters you should be here for. If you're not, cool. If you are, hopefully you're blessed by it. You should be. It's the word of God. Father, we thank you for being who you are and for your faithfulness. We thank you that you are a God of order, Lord, and that you have set order in this universe. You have set order in this world. And more so, you have set order in our lives, Lord. We ask that you would fill us with your spirit fresh. As we go out, that you would guide our minds and our hearts to walk with you and in you. That you would give us a hunger and thirst for your word outside of church, Lord. That we would spend time with you at home. That we'd spend time with you in the car, Lord. That we would talk to you throughout the day, Father. And that we'd allow you to work in us and to do the things that you were trying to do through us, Father. I thank you for these beautiful people, this beautiful city. I ask, Lord, that you would just do a mighty work here. Would you bless these people going out? Would you hold their hand and cause your face to shine upon them, Father? We should love you and praise you for who you are in Jesus' name. Amen.